you are listening to the North Carolina Food and Beverage Podcast. Thank you for downloading and subscribing. Coming to you virtually live from high atop the historic Raleigh building in beautiful downtown Raleigh. The NCF&B takes the listener behind the scenes to tell the stories of the people that contribute to the creation of the food and beverage community of North Carolina. And now, eating off your plate when you're not looking, it's Max Trujillo and Matthew Weiss. Hello, and thank you for listening to the North Carolina Food and Beverage Podcast. I am your co-host, Max Trujillo. And I am your co-host, Matthew Weiss. And to the mountains we go today to talk about this market and little chef stand that you might not have ever heard of, but that's what we're here for. And here to tell us all about it is Chef Scott Alderson. Welcome, Chef. What's up, guys? Hey, man. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thank you for joining us. I spoke about you on a previous episode that included my wife as the co-host, mainly because she was my travel companion on our little trip out there to Highlands to see our good friend Guy Davis, our mutual friend Guy Davis, who is a great winemaker and has a uh, fantastic story. He told us there's a great secret restaurant almost no one knows. It's in Cashers. If listeners are familiar with this area, we're talking outside of Asheville, in the mountains. And I'm not using hyperbole when I say this is in, it's next to an Ingalls grocery store. It's in a strip mall. What are the two businesses to the left and right of you? It's officially a shitty dumpy strip center. I'm in between a hair salon and a carpet store with a Dollar General and a pharmacy and a a nail salon and an auto parts store. All the reasons you need to go there. Yeah, that sounds perfect. Your restaurant, I guess it's a market that's called Native Prime Provisions, and it's not easy to find, and you don't really have a sign. I think the sign up front just says meat, fish, meat and fish. So if you don't know it's there, you're not going to know. But now you know, so now you know. And if you go there, you got to follow very strict rules. We're going to get into those. Guy Davis kind of told me, he's like, it's not for everyone, but it's the best. And I believe you have these strict rules of only 10 at a time. And we were the ninth and 10th people. And so Guy and Cooper would have been the 11th and 12th, thus leaving him out in the cold. And we, I was like, I don't know what to do. I'm scared. I've heard this guy's like the soup Nazi. I think I'm supposed to just go in here and just shut up. That's my perspective. What's your perspective of your business? <sighs> Well, there's not a strict rule of 10 people. We literally only have 10 seats. It's a counter with 10 seats. So it's literally first come, first serve. There's no way to make it be any different. So it's not really a rule that I made. It's just made a small restaurant, a really small restaurant. We can do some manipulation, like stick a couple of chairs on the chef side of the table. Yeah. Explain. There's a couple of extra people that need to sit down. Uh, we don't do that for everybody either because we're a very busy retail market and it takes all our effort to do that. It's probably 50% of our sales is, is the butcher shop, fish counter, retail side of things. And right behind that is a little 10 seat restaurant that takes every single bit of our effort to prepare the food for. And we couldn't do it for any larger size. We don't have servers. You're eating in the kitchen. And the cooks and me are the server and Tanya, my wife, and, and that's how it rolls. Yeah. You're also a wine market, right? The whole thing evolved from a long story process. One of my side hustles during the years since I've moved back to this plateau, this little hamlet village, rainforest, mountaintop, enclave of, of wealth, was doing summertime farmer markets, Wednesday afternoons and Saturday mornings with Started bringing in fresh seafood because I'm a South Florida boy and my wife's from the Bahamas and we were sick and tired of eating trout. (laughs) Started some of my old fish connections and started bringing fish into the markets. And we kind of proved the concept over two summer seasons and I said, well, I don't really want to get the reptile business again, but I think this retail meat fish market thing would work and we have lots of limitations environmentally here and sewage and water stuff with our little unincorporated village. So it took a long time to find a location suitable, and we finally found it. And it, the size is the size, and it was intended to be just the retail market. 
Well, there was a little linear space in the shop that adding more refrigeration wasn't going to help me sell more meat and fish. So I was like, okay, like reluctantly, begrudgingly, I was like, I'll put a little counter bar and maybe we'll do breakfast. <laughs> and maybe we'll do a little capacity on Friday nights. And well, it turned into this crazy lunch situation where <clears throat> we probably have a $150 check average lunch. And we serve really, really high value proteins from all around the world. Everything's FedEx, UPS, so it's everything has all that extra charge on top of it. Yeah, we ate extremely well, and I think our check average was actually 250 person. Yeah. <laughs> but we also went nuts. And there was a lot of wine being poured. Wine is part of it. And so back to the wine question, I had a 10 bottle list to open. And my dear friend, Kara, who, who's my wine guru with my one distributor that I use, she picked me out 10 beautiful bottles of wine that pour by the glass that would go with the kind of food that I serve. I want to pause there for a second, selfishly. You did a very smart thing. You let the wine people handle the wine. You said, my distributor, I trust you. Write my wine list for me. It, it wasn't your book, though, Matt. I just want to I know that. I, I already spoke to my wine bow uh, yeah. colleague out there. You don't deal with wine bows. Matt, Matt is a wine rep as well and knows his... I believe you you got a lot of Kermit Lynch in your portfolio, which is not a bad thing. There's a lot of good wine in that book. And Pretty much Kermit Lynch and Wilson Daniels, and that's it. Yeah. So uh, try on is... Try on distributing. Yeah. yeah. So now we're up like 80, 90 bottles. Whenever I, I got two bottles of Domain, Roman Conti, the Grand Echezo, and the Corton. Nice. 10,000 bucks a bottle. I, I got all the first growth Bordeaux. I have the brand new guy, Barbaresco, releases in the, the single vineyards coming from Mr. Angelo. And I got second growth, third growth, fifth growth. And, and, and I'm, I stick to the old world stuff for the most part. Even my California stuff are, are Burgundian in style. I'm just a Burgundy uh, geek. I probably know more about wine than most chefs, but I still just want the experts to guide me. Yeah. If she's telling me about it, then I just say, send it. Well, as somebody who's worked for Wilson Daniels, the fact that you get any DRC is a testament to even the Eshes and Corton is a testament to your business because, you know, those, yeah. they don't just allow those bottles to go anywhere. Uh -uh. That leads me to why you probably are not going to get the DRC if someone doesn't know about your place first and even firsthand get an experience because from the outside looking in, you know, like I can't stress this enough. This is like a diamond in the rough in the roughest of the rough. Just you're not expecting it. But I will say like separately, Cashers, Highlands, uh, Matt, this is like rich people land. This oh, is, yeah. You got coin in this town, right? Oh, yeah. When we went to visit <laughs> High Hampton, I'll <laughs> yes. never forget Sarah and I went for a walk. Of our hike. Yeah. And we were looking at these houses and she's like, oh, what do you think these cost? I'm like, oh, you know, they're probably like maybe a million, you know. And then we talked to other people. They're like, no, that's Nick Saban's house right there. And that's Kirby Smart's house. Like, why don't you times that by about five? Yeah, they're like five yeah. to eight million. So like, uh, as Guy said to me, kiddingly, he goes, this isn't where people have their second home. This is where they have their third or fourth home. <laughs> and that's probably accurate. So, OK, but also, Matt, are, are you familiar with the documentary, Euro Dreams of Sushi. Of course. Yeah. Okay. Scott, I mean, maybe there's a parallel in this. If you're, if the listeners are not familiar with this uh, documentary, it's about this very old, like, you know, uh, octogenarian, but maybe even older. He might be older than Joe Biden, which is Well, that would still make him an octogenarian. Though. Right. But well, and this came out maybe 15 years ago, if not 20 years ago. Hero, so. Hero's probably 100 now. Yeah, Hero's probably 100 if he's still with us, and I hope so. But Hero is in Japan and has this tiny little sushi bar in a mini mall in like inside a mall on the second floor. And it has what, maybe eight seats, seven seats. It, it might be less than yours. Many would say he's making the best sushi in the world or he's in the category. You know, he's upper echelon and you're nodding your head. Yes. So I don't sound like I'm talking completely out of my ass. So but I'm looking at it and I would say it would go to show that you're kind of doing something in this vein. I wouldn't call your place necessarily a sushi bar because you're doing other things as well, but that element is strong. So you don't just come upon understanding this skill. So we'll go back in time a little bit and let's learn a little bit. We moved to North Carolina when I was younger. My culinary school training was in Asheville. My first executive chef job was at Wade Hampton Golf Club right here in Cassius. My second chef job was at Google Club, which talked about this wealth that's here. 
I think the statistic a while back was there's more Fortune 500 second homeowners and Islands and Cashers than anywhere in the United States. But that's why we have this little uh, target market here to do things like this. But I trained, you know, I started the marketplace in Nashville under Mark Regenstein, and, and I worked for his former wife earlier than that at the Frog and Owl Cafe in Highland. Yeah. All historical, amazing restaurants way before social media and, and press and things like that. But when Farm to Table was a catch word, it was literally some dude wearing overalls, no shirt, would ring the back door and have a brown paper sack full of mushrooms or a brown paper sack full of raspberries. And the milk would come in glass bottles still and we had a trout tank in the cooler and the live trout would come in and we would keep the trout in the cooler live in the tank so my training was i thought that's how all restaurants works well last place i worked we had this guy that just brought raspberries and he didn't have any clothes on uh, <laughs> so to go back a little bit i spent about a half a million dollars in this shitty dumpy strip center at my 1100 square foot spot so it is kind of a little oasis in the rough, as you would say. Yeah. And when we say it's hard to find, it's kind of by design because we have about 2,000 people on a private text group. And all we do is tell those people what we're doing each week. And those are the majority of our customers. And we tell everybody, like, don't tell people. Yeah. It's the most bizarre business model that anybody's ever come up with. I'm like, don't tell your friends about this place. We don't have enough seats. If you want to sit here and eat lunch, don't bring guests. Just come with your, you and your wife and don't bring anybody. And they roll in with like four other people like, I got two chairs for you right now. I don't have six chairs. I told you not to bring friends. That's where that kind of funny suit Nazi thing comes in. This, I just go, hey, you're eating in my living room. I, I built my home here. You're yeah. not a customer. You're a guest. You're not in a restaurant. You're in my house. So be a good guest, and I also charge you extra for being a guest. So that's the difference. <laughs> yeah, I gotta start doing that at my house. <laughs> Once everybody understands what we're doing here, I'm not an asshole. I'm a great guy, and we have a really fun time together. We take care of people very well. A very high level of hospitality, but we can't handle allergies, and we're not a place for people that are in a rut. And you have to be willing to wait to get in. And if you can't do those things, then we can't help you. And some people take that as we're not being open to all types of service. We're just like, we just have 10 seats. So I have to ask, because you used the word and it almost, you took it out of my mouth. You said reluctantly open the counter. I mean, why then? Because it, it just seems like you are, yeah, you're begrudgingly doing this. Like, I think... It's obvious that you love the sourcing of the ingredients. You love the idea of great food. But the other part seems to stick in your craw a little bit. Yeah, I mean, I've had, this is my fifth restaurant in my life, and, and I've had a bunch of chef jobs, and I'm, I'm 57 years old, and the stress and strain and difficulty of restaurants is, is more than anybody could possibly imagine unless you've actually done it at a high level under the most difficult circumstances as it is, and I'm just tired of it. So it's not like I hate restaurants or hate cooking. It's like this, the, the challenges that come with running a restaurant are more than I'm interested in enduring anymore. Retail part, it's like super easy. Yeah. It's like, hey, here's some sea salt from Hatter's. And I bought it for $4 and I put it on the shelf and I sell it for $8. And no shelf. I didn't have to cook it or do anything to it. It's just. Retail. Yeah. I, I completely get it. Trust me, yeah. from somebody who's yeah. walked away and never walked back into restaurants in 2011, I mean, tangentially, I'll, I'll walk in them, but, you know, I don't spend my service, I don't spend service in a restaurant anymore. Max walked away about a year ago because yeah. he went back in after a long time. And I looked at him I'm like, yeah, I don't get it. But hey, man, you got to do you. So I get it, man. So why not just make more of the market? Because I'm a chef and I love to cook food. Mm. And I naturally gravitate back to what I'm best at. Mm. And when, you know, the revenue of just the market is only like right here. Yeah. And I know that the revenue needs to be here. The only thing I can do is cook food and sell to people. Yeah. And at service them. So this idea of just doing beignets, cafe LA, and peach in the morning never materialized. And doing 18 course on Macassar and Friday and Saturday night never materialized because we're so freaking busy 
just doing the retail stuff. The only thing I could do is I'm here during the day. I can cook lunch. Right. So I like a little three or four item menu on disposable bamboo. And I'm like, ah, I'm sick and tired of putting food on bamboo. I'll, I'll buy some cool Japanese pottery. And then I'm sick and tired of pouring wine and shitty glasses. So I'll get some Riedel. And, and before you know it now, it's a joint. You back walked into a, into a full food restaurant. Just when you think you're out. <laughs> yeah. They pulled you they, back they in. They godfathered you. The The environment is really magnificent, though, because it is true. Like, once you open the door and you walk inside, you are transformed. I know this sounds like over the top, but it's true. Like, you have amazing artwork. You can see in the back over your shoulder. Giyotaku or Giyotoku, where they get a, a brand new fresh fish, and they, the art is multifaceted. It's, they collect the soot from the oil-burning fireplaces in the apartment complexes in Tokyo. And that's your ink is the soot from the fireplaces. And then how you prepare that ink and how you apply it to the fish. And then the kind of paper that you put over the top of the fish and how you pull it back off and transpose the ink fish onto the paper is what Giyotoku art is. And I've always been fascinated with it. But your kitchen is really cool. Your equipment is like top notch. Your team is very cool. When I was there, I was watching. It was you and two others, a young lady and a man, and they looked very happy to be there, which is also a big tell. They were very enthusiastic, and they were, like, bringing you things, and they're cooking their own things, and there's a lot of collaboration. For anyone sitting there, you've got a perfect eyesight onto Chef Scott's knife skills. I'm watching him slicing, you know, maybe a, a tuna or something, and I'm watching him do the... I love the, you know, the two finger kind of press with the sushi roll and you're hand rolling everything. Oh, by the way, for the listeners that might be only listening and not watching, we're taping this episode. This is the first episode in a new studio. That's right. Yeah. Welcome to our new roomy studios. The North Carolina Food <clears throat> and Beverage Podcast hasn't really moved. We just changed rooms inside of the kitchen studios. We used to have a place that was like a shoebox this big. And now it's like this big. It's, yeah. it's almost double the now. Yeah. So much room. We're going to do yoga after yeah, this. Yeah, we're so stretched out right now. But but yeah, so we're moving on up. It's nice. We we got a nice space in here. So check us out on YouTube if you are if you're only listening. That way you get to see the you know Scott's beautiful face and, and we'll go from there. But the vibe was great. When we walked in, when Tanya took our head count, and then ultimately when Guy and Cooper, his son, showed up, you did what you had mentioned. You brought a couple extra chairs and you sat them around on the chef's side and Actually, funny enough, there was an older couple at the end and you looked at them. You're like, you two move down because they're with them. And they were like, oh, yes, sir. And they just moved out. <laughs> I'm sure they're regulars. You knew them. They seemed like they were friendly with you. But it's all great. It comes through that you are you are a sweetheart. Your vibe is like a little gruff. But I knew who you were the second I saw you. Not in, in, in a shitty way, but I'm like, no, no, this is a good guy. He just... It's a matter of fact type of thing. Like, I'm not going to mince words here, folks. This is this. If you don't like it, it's kind of on you, not on me. So maybe speak to that because Matt and I were talking about that before. Matt, I don't want to steal your question, but maybe get into that. We were talking about well, I what mean, your customers I, might say from I, time I, I was time. reading some, some, doing my research, and I, I don't know. I don't, you don't strike me as somebody who reads Google reviews. I've seen a few of those. Yeah. <laughs> It was, uh, I will say it was a pattern. There were definitely some people that took offense. Uh, I, don't, yeah. I, I don't know. I mean, it's hard for me to say. I've never been there. I've uh, only met you now, and it's clear that you have a passion for what you do and a talent. But I will say the words that somebody used the word humiliated, dehumanized. <laughs> you know, we're, we're in a, a state of society where... People are so entitled and they have these expectations, especially of hospitality, as if we are the servants of these people. Yeah. And part of this counter idea was me and my entire history of restauranting and how we constantly are just catering to these people and their every whim. And when they're a little bit snotty or snooty and bossy, we just are like, Yes, ma'am. I'll get that right away. Right. Yes, I'm, I'm very sorry that one of the ice is not big enough ice cube for years. And it's all this yeah. stuff. And like, wait a minute. We, we've jumped the shark on what we would call radical hospitality. And 
taking care of somebody and, and the effort that we put into coming to work and preparing food to me, that is the radicalness of it. And making this small chef kitchen, little dream kitchen space for me and three other people to work in and this little tiny dining room that's a counter in my kitchen. I just said to myself, I'm going to do it for me. And I literally tell people, I go, I've been taking care of all you people for so long. It's not about you anymore. It's literally about me. <laughs> I'm going to cook what I want. You can get a whole lot of questions. If you've got allergies, you should get up right now, so on and so forth. And I guarantee you that you're going to like your food and you're going to like your service. And if you don't, I'll give you all your money back plus a $50 gift card, and, and nobody's ever taken me up on that. The people that have been, quote, humiliated are rude people who you're nice to a couple times and so rude, then you tell them to get the F out. And they're like, oh, that guy's a jerk. I'm like, hmm. You're the jerk. Right, yeah. And we have been conditioned to, and we kind of have to put up with these people in the grand scheme of restaurants because people have giant, huge loans, and, and they have 150-seat dining rooms, and they have to maximize the seating. I don't. I can literally not put up any jerks yeah and there, there's no two ways about it those people were offensive to us and we put up with zero percent of that and every one of my chef friends and restaurateur friends is like oh my god you're doing it exactly how we, we want it wish oh we could do it. yeah it's like a dream it's like a wish well i think i i Totally, and obviously there's two sides to every story, but I totally empathize with your perspective on that. And I also see the other people's point, but I also think like, you know, you either heard, you mentioned the word radical hospitality or, and Will Guadera of the bear and EMP wrote that book on reasonable hospitality, which I'm most of the way through now. And he talks about, yes, they are there to take care of the servers, but I'm paraphrasing and wildly here, but there has to be a mutual respect because they're not here to serve you. They literally take passion in elevating your experience and creating a great experience. So please respect that. And yeah, I just serve food. It's not serve you. There's a couple other ways to look at this. We're not a publicly funded operation. We're not taxpayer funded. We're, we're not a public trust. It's, a, it's an independent entrepreneurial business that um, the customer has no say whatsoever in, in anything. And somehow in restaurants, we've been twisted into this thing that we have to take care of these people. And we, we can't grasp that or, or twist that around enough on our heads for anybody to ever really accept that. So when the lady goes, do you have free soy sauce? I go, no. And she goes, why not? I go, because I don't want to. <laughs> I'm not responsible for your diseases or your allergies. If you really are that allergic to gluten you probably should never walk into a restaurant ever it's just i'm not responsible for your health so if you want something else i can make you something without soy sauce but i can't make you nigiri with gluten-free soy sauce because i don't have that yeah and they, and, and they got up and they left i'm like i really don't care i honestly don't because it's not my responsibility you're a guest in my home and you shouldn't respect that and, well and, and enjoy it that's the mentality that you brought up earlier when you said you're a guest in my home. So if you take that philosophy all the way through, you wouldn't allow someone, you know, the, the whole thing is like, you can't speak to me like that in my own house, you know, but like, it, it, that is the truth. I mean, if Matt came over to my house and started telling me like, Oh, why'd you put the TV over there? And why didn't you do this? Man. Like, no, I'd be like, get the fuck out of my house, man. Like, you, like, this is the way I did it because I like it this way. And I think even that same reviewer would say the same thing if you went to their house and started barking out orders and complaining and like challenging what they do. So I get it. And the safety that you have is that you put out really good food and you have that 2000 person list and that always is growing and now of course because you're on this podcast that there's gonna be a line out the door yeah but I, broadcast this. yeah we won't even no one's listening it's fine but the nice part was when we walked in and then the door was locked because it's like well you can't really you can't serve any more people at this point and you need to focus on the people in, at hand and let's be honest with those 12 people, if they're doing, you're saying 150, but I saw everyone throwing down. So I think that particular service was a good service 
people were buying really good things and all of that. If you look at it, you're like, yeah, this one lunch is going to be a good revenue generator. And then I can, you know, I think like as we were close to the end of our multi-course meal, the doors unlocked because some people wanted to come in and buy some fish and maybe buy some wine to go. And so Tanya was taking care of that in the front. And then it was like, as we were slowly getting out that second wave, your second turn was coming in. And then you probably did that. And I would have to imagine on a Sunday, I think like, that's it. It's probably two turns and you're done. Does that, that sound about right? Yeah, sometimes we pick up snakes and make the turns in there, but it, it's not really a seeding thing. It's just, it fills up right away. Like we open at, the shop door is open at 11. We, we start lunch service at 11.30. There's people outside sitting in the rocking chairs at 10.30. Dealing, you know, we're here first. They open the door. Hey, we're, we're here, we're here, we're here. I go, okay. And then, and then they come in, we see them, and it's usually about two hours before they're done eating lunch, and then people will be waiting, and we'll start a little bit of a wait list, but we don't even really like doing all this. It's almost like making a reservation. What would someone expect if they walked in this week into your restaurant? Mm -hmm. Well, there's a pattern of procurement that I've settled into fairly well. I have a husband and wife team in Key West. I have a market kind of just like ours as far as meat and fish go. They don't have the like a sushi bar counter sort of thing or whatever. But, and he actually is a fisherman captain. He has a boat. He goes out and gets yellowtail snappers, groupers and stuff in Key West. And he's right in the harbor and he buys fish from other boats. So he literally goes out, catches fish, puts it in a box and sends it to me. It could be stone crab claws. It could be Key West pink shrimp. It could be yellowtail snappers, mangrove snappers. It goes on and on. I just go, Brian, what do you got? I go, okay, put it in a box. Fill me a 20 pound box. Yeah, mix fish. I don't even care what it is, and it comes the next day. Same thing in Moorhead City, Beaufort, North Carolina. Same thing in Hatteras. Same thing in Juan Cheese, North Carolina, and the Outer Banks. We have a, a lady in Swan Quarter. It's called the Inner Banks, where the swamps and the river mouths meet the Pamlico Sound. Yeah, creates the water that makes the the Outer Banks. And all she does is crab. She goes and gets crab, and she steams the crabs. This hundred year old wood fired boiler. And she picks the crab, chills it down, puts it in the containers. I get it the next day. All the oysters I get come in one single box from this part of North Carolina, this part of North Carolina, this part of North Carolina. The oysters come in a box. The shrimp lady was 24 miles to the road, and she's the sister of the crab lady. And she catches shrimp and puts it in the box and you send it to me. We can tell a story about all of our products, and our customers trust it, and they believe it and proofs on the pudding because they buy it and they take it home and they eat it and they freak out. What about your uh, wasabi? Yeah, it's a pretty cool story too. It's a company called Real Wasabi and he actually lives here in, in near Cashers, a little town called Glenville and he imports the pitchy culture of these wasabi plants from Japan and he aeroponically grows them into starts and then he sells these starts to wasabi farmers all around the world. And then he buys all their wasabi back from all around the world. And then he sells the wasabi to his chef friends. Wow. Uh, but he also has a creek in the mountains where he lives on a hundred acres, about 10 miles from here. And he gives me the wasabi out of the creek that he doesn't really sell to other people because he just keeps them for, for starter plants and things like that. So I get the most beautiful wasabi from a creek. Yeah, it was noticeable. Like the flavor was it, it, like you, you had a cool. sense of place so you could really feel you could taste the environment in the wasabi. It, it, it was crazy. I get big eye tuna from Hawaii. I get bluefin tuna right now from Maine, plus anything that grows in Maine and gets caught in Maine, Gulf, Gulf of Maine cod and halibut and things like that. I like aim. That's my passion now. I still like cooking, of course. But yeah. This procurement has been taking all my energy. Yeah. And what what I like also about your uh, story is it uh, talks about relationships that you have with these vendors, like in the wine example, where you just give people carte blanche, like you trust them and you say, I know you know what you're doing. Bring me the best stuff. The oyster lady, the crab lady. I love that style of business. I wish more people would have that <laughs> kind of blind faith. Now, you can't have it in everybody, and obviously you know, you've know you done this for a long time, and you know these people are not going to bring you the garbage. They're going to bring you the good stuff. So, But I, I, I think that's a great model yeah. for people. Like, it's like being a good band and just saying, like, 
I'm not going to tell the drummer how to play the beat. I'm not going to tell the bass player how to play the groove. Like, I'm just going to have a really good drummer and a really good bass player and just know that they're going to do what they're supposed to do. And they're only here because we know how good they are, you know? And I'm sure they feel the same way about you, Scott. Like, we're not just going to give this wasabi or this fish to any old schmuck and have him ruin it. And, you know, like, I mean, of course, everyone wants to make money, but like, the best way to make money is to also make sure that your product is being taken care of and exhibited in the best you know, environment possible because that great fish or shrimp or whatever just overly boiled and just set out will lose all of its beauty. And then no one's going to think that sourcing was remarkable because the cooking style was horrendous. So it all has to be one to the next. And you, that's the nice marriage you have with your relationships. The level of meticulous craft that you're putting in might make someone think that, you know, maybe this place is like stuffy or it's, you know, it's like this fine dining place where you got to like mind your P's and Q's. And even though we like kind of kidded around the uh, soup Nazi, uh, uh, it couldn't be further from the truth. You would, were cranking up the music. And I laughed. I was like, oh, they're playing my Spotify mix. And you weren't specifically, of course, we didn't even know each other. But literally every song that was played was like what I'm listening to right now. It was like, I think it was like Sublime came on and then there was like some Incubus and then there was like some Bob Marley and then there was Jack Johnson. And it was like kind of vibey, beachy, but like cool. And the music's loud and it's like wild. And you're just hey, everybody just have fun. Like, let's just let our hair down and be silly and. Now, like people are talking to each other and having fun. And of course, it doesn't hurt that the wine's flowing. But the vibe was also, I would say, something you can't necessarily bottle. But you manufacture through your own vibe and how you present yourself with your guests. And it does truly feel like an intimate I'm at the chef's home environment. And I have to imagine that's calculated to an extent or maybe we're, that's just you're just being who you are all the time is that just like your vibe in general that's part of this whole idea what we're doing here is that you're in our house and it's our little place and you're just joining us and to our party that we're doing and we do play the music really loud and it's really fun and we kind of do say to people that are new it's like if you play your cards right and we don't kick you out you get to be part of our family and they're like and then when they leave we give them a hug and a kiss we literally hug everybody that leaves here. yeah and 90% of the people that sit at this counter have probably been here 40 or 50 times in their lives, at least in two years or three years. And it be, it's really this little family. And then the new people come in and it's kind of weird. We're like, oh my God. And sometimes we play Billy Holiday and John Coltrane. And sometimes we play Sublime. And sometimes we play Earth, Wind, and Fire. And sometimes we play The Who. And then sometimes we play Van Morrison, Radio. Hell yeah. And so we really have a party fun time. And there's three aspects when you walk into a place. It's like lighting, temperature, and music. We all talk about this in all my restaurant pals. It's like lighting, temperature, music. Well, we play the music way too loud. It's way too cold. And it's kind of bright because we're in a kitchen, so it can't be yeah. alarming and, and dark. And it's kind of cool because we have to get it cold because we got a heat source of the kitchen that's going to make it warm eventually. Mm -hmm. And they were like, this is not background music, man. Music is the vibe. We're going to we're gonna play good music loud. We curse. We make fun of each other. We make fun of customers. I tell two old ladies, I can tell right now you're going to be a pain in the ass. But they're like, I go, are you? No, we're going to be fine. Actually, we're really fine. I'm like, okay, well, let's just see. And that's just the way we do it. You know, Matt, there's probably a little bit of this element of like, you know, they always say that the CEO is the guy that wants to like get be like dominated by like a, you know, oh, yeah. dominate tricks or whatever, because they're never told what to do. And so that's maybe, you know, that's going to be the title of this episode is like, you know, it's the sadomasochistic uh, culinary experience or so. But like, I think there's something there where, let's be honest, your clientele is pretty wealthy. And so they're probably not told no very often. So when they hear it, they're like, oh, that's so gauche. I love it. Well, yeah, they're, they're the richest people in the world. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't get told no ever. Right. I, have, I have two questions before we get out of here. Have you ever had a, 
uh, guest in this that has intelligently talked back to you and be like, actually, no, that's not the case. Or uh, I, I don't really respect how you're talking to me right now. Never really exactly like that. One guy would say, okay, big boy, I got you. Like, yeah. He would say something like that. Like I'm know? picking up what you're putting down. Yeah. 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 So nobody's really said, hey, we don't like what you're saying to me right now. Be nicer to my wife. I'd I say, say sometimes, sometimes like, like somebody might punch me in the top one day. I don't know if it's, <laughs> if it's going to happen or whatever, but we've, we've had, had to kick some people, people out physically for being rude. Mm. We've, we've had, had some people storm out over over the displeasure with the structure how we're doing business here and it's hard. Do you ever worry, though, about somebody getting pissed off with the restaurant scenario and then because you talked about revenue, that's somewhat of concern and then not buying from the market because of the ex because of having a negative experience? You, you know, know, we, we lose customers sometimes, sometimes, you know, you look a couple of those Google reviews or whatever, and there's 30 great ones and 10 bad ones or whatever. And those people didn't like how we do it. You know, people come in bossy and my wife will say, hey, I'll get with you, sir. And one guy came back the other day. He's like, you said you're going to get with me soon. And you didn't. And I left. And now I'm coming back to tell you that I'm mad at you. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> man, you must have nothing in your life to worry about. If this is what you're worried about. Yeah. You know, I don't really have an explanation for it or <laughs> an apology for any of it. Yeah. Um, I just want everybody to get to the chance to experience these great ingredients. And, but yeah, I guess the, the thing is, it's not for everybody. That's it. Max, could you, we're not for everybody. Could you imagine bringing Sarah to this lunch counter? We're talking about Matt's wife. Sarah is gluten free and she has like a nightshade allergy and a couple other, you know, things. So, but loves good food. She's like Sally from when Harry met Sally when she orders. <laughs> yeah, I'll have what she's having. But I want to know. Yeah, I don't see Sarah having a good time here. She would have to be prepped, but also I could see her like getting in a very big argument with Chef Scott, but oh, yeah. in a good way. Scott, almost, was, he would have like, thrown us out 15 minutes into your wife <laughs> talking to him. Let me touch on that just a little bit because we give people lots of clear information in the beginning. Within they they storm in here 45 minutes early, and we say, you know, we don't start eleven. Yeah, and, and the people that have been there before, they know. Some people are like, no, I thought you opened at eleven. We got Nelly up at 11.30, and if they get huffy and they leave, so be it. And if somebody says, I just want tap water, and I say, well, we still charge you $9, so you might as well get the sparkling or the still water. Well, I just want tap water. I go, we only have 10 seats. We don't give away stuff. Yeah. So sparkling or still water. And sometimes they get up and leave because they think it's ridiculous that they have to pay for water. And if somebody has particular dietary restriction and they humbly request or inquire it's different when when somebody goes i'm gluten free tell me what you got what can you do for me make sure i don't get sick that's the part where i say it's not my responsibility now i will i can easily make you something that's gluten free and has no tomatoes or eggplant or strawberries but easily it's really how we interact from the very beginning that we have very low compromise for anybody that feels entitled. Mm. Yeah, maybe a, the approach is a really great sense. I mean, look, I could be a dick very often. Matt knows. And I can okay. have no, I know what you mean. <laughs> oh, my, my family, they always get on me because, like, I saw... And just the other day, I saw these unhoused people, these homeless guys... Walking across the the street, but they were jaywalking where they were going against when the traffic was, the light was red for them, but they crossed anyways. And don't get me wrong. And it's where like my daughters think I'm contradictory all the time because they're like, dad, you jaywalk all the time. I said, yes, I jaywalk when there is no one coming and I'm not impeding anyone. I'm not just walking out in the middle of the street going, fuck off, everyone, stop while I walk. You're a conscientious jaywalker. Yes, exactly. And so I saw these guys crossing, and what it did for traffic is make all the cars that were trying to turn left have to stop in the intersection. Then the light turned green for the oncoming traffic, but these other cars were now in the section. And I said, look, it didn't happen in this moment, but what if... 
someone was screaming down that on well, like going straight and didn't see that, you know, there were cars in there. And then all of a sudden someone gets T-boned. Is it the person that like had to slam on their brakes in the intersections fault because the person walking across or is it the asshole pedestrian who just got in the way? And I said, this is what I have a problem with. It's specific things. Just follow the rules, be decent, be cordial and understand your approach. And maybe, maybe you, Scott and I, maybe we should just get a cabin together and live together. Cause now I think I'm falling in love with you. I think that's what it is. It's very liberating. Very liberating to not give a fuck anymore about what people that who feel like they're entitled and let's do it your own way. Yeah. But you know that you're going to actually give them something great and they're going to really really like it and that you're really going to be nice to them. And as long as they don't follow through on their entitled snobbery, everything can work out fine. And it has worked out fine. It yeah. It still has worked out fine. And Google reviews be damned. I tell people sometimes, please write bad reviews because we have too many customers and not enough. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can get rid of like, you know, that's the whole thing in like the hiring process, like in businesses, you're supposed to always be, you know, cutting the bottom 10 percent and improving the top 10 percent. Like you're supposed to always you're evolve. So turning the bottom. Exactly. So you can do that with your clientele. Why not? I think we're so, you know, and, you know, maybe you can't do that at like the fast, casual, high volume burger joint in town because you, you need every dollar to make that but i think you've carved out a place where you utilize maybe your skill and your abilities have afforded you the reason and the opportunity to be more selective with your clientele and you know what it's a free world free country you do it how you want i had one of the best meals i've talked about it now twice on two different podcasts and now we've got you on the show because this experience was so impactful and, and so, you know, you're getting the Trujillo bump from me because it was awesome. And Matt, we're, we might go to, uh, I think, the, what, Highlands Festival's coming up? Highlands Food and Wine Festival, yeah. Yeah, so maybe yeah. we'll have to, like, creep over. Like, it would make sense for us to go over there and and we'll grab Guy because he's a good guy. And, you know, we'll pop a couple of his bottles of rosé sparkling and, and we'll drink and eat really well at your place. Well... We, we close for two weeks a year, the, the first two weeks of November, and that's during Highlands Wine and Food. So. Oh, well, you, to... <laughs> you asshole! Oh, oh my... God damn it, I'm going to write a review. Oh, I would be so pissed. Yeah, I'd be so pissed, though, if I drove all the way out there and you were closed. <laughs> Anyhow, Matt, uh, what else you got? Scott, this has been this has been great and refreshing, and I'll tell everybody out there. I don't know. Maybe don't go to Native Prime Provision. Yeah, don't do it. But if you want to eat and drink extremely merrily, don't ask for the gluten-free soy sauce, but check out Native Prime Provision. Thank you for listening to the North Carolina Food and Beverage Podcast. By rating us online, you're helping others to discover our show. Follow us on all platforms at NCFBPod.